Without further ado, I think we should get to the next expert who's really specialized in this area, Professor Kevin Autosom, who teaches health law and corporate law at Boston University, where he co-directs the health law program, which is actually one of the top three health law programs in the US. And besides that, if that would not keep him busy enough, uh, Professor Autoson, he is also the executive director of the Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria Biopharmaceutical Accelerator, CARP-X, which is an enormous global, a very powerful global partnership hosted at the Boston University uh, Law School that is focused on supporting developers of promising new antibiotics, diagnostics, and vaccines that tackle the threat of untreatable bacterial infections. We are very happy to have you with us, Kevin. The stage is yours. Thank you. The interesting thing about this whole area, 15 or 16 years ago, I, I got, I followed a curious idea, and I've ended up spending the bulk of that time increasingly focused on antimicrobial innovation, or really the lack of it. And uh, this is a, a, a testament to, if you're an academic, it's dangerous to be curious. You never know where it leads you. And for me, I was writing my first law review article, my first uh, you know, major article as a law professor, and it was about innovation in the pharmaceutical space. And I read everything, and and, and was you know trying to come up with something innovative to say as a, as a new professor. And in all of the intellectual property and many of the law and economics arguments in favor of pharmaceutical innovation, I realized that it wouldn't be true, or at least some of the foundational elements wouldn't be true if the innovation itself degraded with usefulness over time. And I just dropped a footnote, it was like footnote five or seven or something beginning, which said that the next 80 pages of this article probably aren't true if, if the innovation degrades over time, such as antibiotics. Went on to write the article. The footnote bothered me so much that uh, it's really been the bulk of the next 15 years uh, of what I've done. And to give a couple of quick examples of how that works, just look at your hand. You know, you probably washed it today. Uh, what's the correct number of uh, bacteria on your hand, right? And uh, the answer is not to eliminate all bacteria from your hand. We, we understand better now the microbiome of, we're beginning to understand the microbiome of various parts of the human body. We don't want our hands to be entirely not colonized by any bacteria. We don't want the pathogenic bacteria there. We want the commensals there. For cancer, it's a different answer. What's the correct number of cancer cells in your body? I, I don't know. I think it's zero, right? But for the microbial world, the answer is not zero, right? The second thing that's different is think about uh, innovation. Look at your cell phone or something or your, or your laptop. It's an innovative product. What happens to innovative products? People line up to buy them and they pay a premium price. What happens to the most innovative antibiotic? For excellent reasons, the doctors, the stewardship committees, public health says, don't buy this, don't use it, put it behind glass, right? And, and for market reasons, we, we've attached a low price to it. So it's, it's, imagine if that was true for cell phones, that you had to go to a committee of experts to prove that you needed to upgrade your cell phone. Right? In my house, that's my spouse, right? You know, but, but imagine if we had to all do that before we could upgrade a phone, what would happen to cell phone innovation? Right? That's what's happened the last 20 years to antibiotic innovation. And I'll describe briefly uh, two projects that, that try to address that, the first being CARBEX and the second one uh, being something we're starting at, at Boston University as well. So these are my funders. It's, a, it's an astonishing amount of money that they've given to us. Uh, it's the largest grant, I think, in the history of Boston University. As of today, it's $455 million, and, and we're negotiating for another $100 million because we're trying to reach the half billion dollar mark uh, to, to influence antibiotic innovation in a dramatic strategic way globally. Uh, the largest funder is the U.S. government. The funds come from NIH and from another agency within Health and Human Services called BARDA. Uh, and uh, the second largest funder is Wellcome Trust, who's given us $155 million as a grant uh, to support this work. And then we have a lot of other partners uh, at the bottom who support us as well. Uh, and uh, you know, some of the, the things, this is a, you know, a slide, not the, exactly the same slide that Aaron showed earlier, which uh, actually... Um, Aaron and I have published a number of papers together in this area, and there's, I don't have any co-author that I would publish again with as, as frequently or as energetically or enthusiastically as with Aaron. If you get the chance to do a paper with him, it's a great experience, and, and you'll go back for more. 
But to thinking about the classes, you know, because it's one thing to say that, you know, in the 1980s there were a lot of new antibiotics, new chemical entities, but a lot of them were just uh, analogs on existing classes and things that were withdrawn from the market later. Uh, they really weren't spectacular. So let's look at new classes, because new classes are, in, you know, are something that represent true innovation, and especially in the world of, of resistance, uh, you know, would bring something to the market that the resistance has not already developed. And so think about you know, new classes against the worst type of bacteria today, the gram-negative, you know, so-called superbugs. Uh, the last time that we had a new class of gram-negatives discovered that reached human ap approval, as opposed to just was touted in a press release, you know, was actually resulted in a drug that was approved by either the EMA or the FDA. The last time that happened for gram-negatives was the year I was born. Do you see this gray hair, right? Do you, do you understand how long ago that was? 55 years, okay? That is a crisis. Imagine, you know, any other field in which there'd been no fundamental innovation that actually reached humans for, for 55 years, okay? So this is like a, we're drawing down the fossil fuel reserves that have been laid down for billions of years and, and we're not replenishing this common pool resource known as antibiotic effectiveness. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard process, it's lengthy and costly, you know, we, we understand that piece of it. And for CARBEX, the goal is to, to try to focus on preclinical assets that are not being funded because the business model is so broken that private funders are not interested. There's a lot of private funding in oncology, why? Because if you can uh, have a drug that extends uh, you know, life by a couple of weeks, or, or maybe not even a mortality benefit, but, you know, progression, you know, survival benefit that progression-free, uh, for just a few weeks, what do you charge for that drug? Sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in the United States, okay? Whereas an antibiotic that saves the life of a 30 or 40-year-old person, uh, the pricing is just dramatically lower. And as a result, private capital has fled this area. In addition to the reason that I described earlier, the most innovative products, are actually sold the least. So it's, it's like the, the whole market system is upside down in antibiotics as a result. And so Carbex's goal is to try to improve the quality of the clinical pipeline, which everyone says is underwhelming. I think that might be too generous, right? By investing in truly antibiotic preclinical assets and moving them along uh, to phase one testing. So this is some of the things that, that, uh, that, uh, that we look at in terms, you know, focusing on, on public health. We're a nonprofit, global, uh, public-private product development partnership. And, uh, and the goal is not pure science. The, the goal is to get products into people that are entirely innovative classes of antibiotics. One thing I want to say about, about this slide, and, and I've got something on the next slide that, that ties into this, said every one of our awards has a contractual condition relating to stewardship and access, right? We're not just caring about innovation, we also care about stewardship and access. And the reason for that is this tripod. And if you think about it, if all you cared about was access, what you would do is to give antibiotics freely over the counter to anyone who asked for them. Well, that's actually kind of what we have been doing, right, in some countries. But Access, if that's your only priority, you destroy the, future gen the drug for future generations. You also undermine innovation, because how can you sell a product if somebody else is giving it away for free? But if you prioritize just innovation, right, what do you end up with? A high-priced drug that's over-marketed, which undermines stewardship, but it also undermines access. How is that thing going to be available in a place like India or China? places where it's dramatically needed today. And if you just focus on stewardship or conservation, you make it hard to get the drug, you put it behind glass, you know, you make committees upon committees before you can get it. That's great for, for the preserving that existing class, but you, you can see how it undermines innovation. How can a company make money on a product they can't sell, right? And, and how, so innovation is undermined and access might be undermined. Politically around the world, you see a lot of interest in Scandinavia and in the United States and in Northern Europe for antibiotic stewardship. You see some skepticism in the global south. They're wondering whether this is another way of, of you know, preventing the drug from getting to them, right? So all these three things have to be solved simultaneously. 
You can't have a solution that focuses on one or the other, all three. For us, we focus on innovation and contractual commitments that are strong on the other two. Another completely separate area of work in this area is called uh, antibiotic delinkage or antibiotic prizes and antibiotic pool incentives. There'll be legislation introduced in Congress this month based on three years of work paid for by the European Union, thank you, and the Drive AV project, uh, trying to do exactly that, you know, a pool incentive that tries to solve simultaneously for all three. So CARBAX, uh, we've been around for 19 months. Uh, it, it feels like longer, right? Uh, because of the amount of work we were doing. And this slide is out of date because it's a week old. Uh, as of this morning, I think, whenever the sun comes up in Boston, we'll have 26 projects we're announcing to today. And uh, we'll be announcing our seventh country, the addition of Japan, uh, a little bit later uh, this week. So we're funding small, m mainly small and medium enterprises, uh, a few larger companies. We really aren't, are agnostic to the size of the company. But the bulk of innovation in this field is coming in, in companies with less than 10 full-time employees, which is an interesting piece of information. You can go to our website and see the actual uh, you know, portfolio. And, uh, and I think the seven number is actually eight uh, as of today. So eight new classes against gram-negative pathogens reflected in our preclinical portfolio as of today. And we have enough money to do this for you know, another three and a half years, right? Uh, in other words, if any of those succeeds to human approval, it's the most innovation we've had in my entire lifetime in this sector, right? So it's, it's pretty important things that are, that are going on uh, within CARBAX. Um, you know, in our first 12 companies, uh, we, we tracked them after we gave them a, an award. Uh, they've actually attracted $485 million worth of investment, the 12 companies, from the moment that we gave them the award until the end of this year, uh, which is a, a pretty high return on, uh, on, on the amount of money that we've actually given them to this point. Uh, in other words, private investors do have some social responsibility interest in this area, uh, but they don't know a lot about antibiotics, and they're relying to an extent on the due diligence that we do with our teams, uh, our, our science review panels from the NIH, from the Wellcome Trust, and, and, and private experts, and, uh, and they're following that on. Uh, another example of private investment in this area is that Novo Holdings, we're hearing a lot about Novo Nordis, but Novo Holdings, the second company in that holding company structure, announced last week a $165 million impact fund called the Repair Fund, focusing on giving dilutive uh, you know, investments in exactly the same space as Carbex. All of our funding is non-dilutive. It's a grant, right? There's no equity, there's no royalty. Uh, Novo Holdings, the repair fund, uh, headquartered here in this same city, $165 million announced last week to do this. So people are moving into the sector, but people that either have a charitable purpose or a social impact, social corporate, corporate social responsibility sort of goal, as opposed to just purely trying to make money. An interesting thing about this field, thinking about the other topics in, uh, in, in the whole study, you know, there's a lot of comparison to antibiotics as being a form of an orphan drug these days because of the inability to sell very many of them and the fact that you're looking for only people with multi-drug resistant, you know, CRE for this particular drug. It's almost like an orphan designation. So there's a lot of ties back to the orphan study. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now in antibiotics and antibiotic therapies as a precision medicine. So everything that's being done right now with monoclonal antibodies in our field, uh, and in addition, uh, the, the phage work that's being done, particularly in Europe, is going to be very personalized you know, in, in the way that they approach. There's a lot of synergies there. Um, for manufacturing, you know, um, the, in, the, in the Davos, uh, I never get invited to Davos, but they send me what they talk about there. But not this last time, but the time before, uh, the industry came out with this Davos statement, and included in it was a major commitment by the industry to change the way they manufacture antibiotics. Particularly, they would ferment them in India, and when they were done with the process, it was just dumped untreated into the, into the waterways, right? And now we have data on what, what happens downstream when you put 10,000 gallons of, of, of wastewater from an antibiotic fermentation process into Indian waterways. It's not good, right? 
So changing the way that those manufacturing practices happen is, 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 is on the cusp in this, in this world. Antibiotics have been historically a small molecule. You know, there's a, a number of large molecule projects uh, that are coming through the carb, carb export portfolio. And the whole, you know, question of new uses, uh, you know, where, where's Ben? <laughs> you know, the, uh, and uh, sitting right behind where I was. But, uh, you know, there's a major project being sponsored uh, by the WHO and by the Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, DNDI, called GARD-P. It's an antibiotic R&D. And they have four projects, and one of the four they call memory recovery, trying to, to find uh, new uses for old antibiotics for which there's not really a patent. Uh, or, you know, and, and they're going to try to do a public health approach to it. Right? So there's a, a lot of synergies in this one area to everything else in, in your research program, uh, for which I'm grateful. So that's the, the first project, is to, to prevent the antibiotic apocalypse, right? to, to keep the most important drug class in human history from, from being destroyed and not having anything to replace it with. Okay? The second project we're working on at Boston University is, uh, it has broader ambitions than that, or maybe different ambitions. I don't know if it could be broader. And I'm going to just talk about that for a minute or two. And this is, a, I call it CIDR, but the Social Innovation on Drug Resistance. There's so many things in this field in which it is not just clever bench or laboratory science, which is the key. So think about diagnostics. There's a lot of wonderful diagnostic technology out there. But what we need is diagnostics that actually change clinical behavior. Right? We don't need another amazing machine. We need a machine that actually changes the way that physicians and patients prescribe and use antibiotics. And that, that human piece of the equation has been remarkably difficult to bridge. Uh, the European Union is about to fund another three-year project called Value DX, uh, you're looking at exactly at this human dimensions, the, the social science, human behavioral piece of antibiotic diagnostics, right? It's an amazing, you know, field to look into. When you think about all of the, the human behavioral aspects, this is what, what CIDR is, is, is trying to focus on. And so some of the things that tie back to, to even to what Aaron just said, um, if you think about the questions we need answered in this area in terms of, you know, biomedical innovation, for example, how much does biomedical innovation cost, right? Where do we know this information from? Well, the industry and, and some academics, what we have is DeMassey's study on, on the billion dollar or $1.8 billion pill, depending on which version, based on survey data from a few large companies and all the data has never been released, right? And, and this is the core of, of how we know or think we know what the cost is uh, for the field, okay? None of the survey data is, is released. The companies know who they're talking to and it may have an incentive to, to, to not report. You know, it, it's just trouble, problematic, right? And a lot of people have criticized this. At Carbax, you can think of us partially as a data generating machine. We will know everything there is to know about the entire antibiotic innovation sector. Uh, at this point, we think about 70% of the preclinical companies have applied to us. We're just launching another $80 million of the round, the first one in March, the second one in, in June of this year. Uh, we think we'll have 90% of the, of the antibiotic preclinical world will have applied to us and through us. And, and we will know exactly what it cost to do the preclinical studies. We'll know exactly how, what the success and failure rate uh, have all of that data, and, and not just survey data that they've given us because they know we're doing that study. They give it to us under penalties of perjury because they're asking for reimbursement under a grant that is partially funded by the, by the U.S. government. Right? So we're going to have the, the, the best imaginable data. We're also going to answer, or at least to have the ability for other researchers to answer questions about things like what is the best way to pick and to give grants, right? Um, you know, we have a system that's akin to an NIH study section, but what sort of actual 
independent research has been done out there on whether those systems actually pick the best projects. What sort of comparison is there of the studies that get funded versus the studies that almost got funded? How do they do five and 10 years later? Right? We have all of the data and we're keeping it specifically not only to try to solve the problems with antibiotic innovation, but to, to allow other researchers to, to look at and uh, to take a, a, you know, a deep dive into our data so that they can answer uh, what actually works in innovation, biomedical innovation generally, right? Uh, how, how do things function? What does it cost? And what, what, are the, what are the ways that they work together? So I knew that patents were important in, uh, you know, obviously in antibiotic innovation, I can tell you I've been surprised by how strongly patents are, 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 the, are the central organizing force for even very young biomedical companies that are barely spun out, right? It's, 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 I thought it was a strong force. It's stronger than I thought in terms of the organizing principle uh, for how companies come out, uh, for good or for ill. Right? And so we hope that uh, with uh, the CIDR project and with CARBEX, uh, to not only do our primary objective, uh, but to work with researchers and other institutions, including all the folks that you've assembled, uh, to do interesting things with the data that we've collected, because there's so many fascinating, curious questions to follow. But uh, be careful um, where your curiosity takes you. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was, that was great. Um, a fantastic presentation on a really, really, really important uh, topic and um, really wonderful work that we, you are doing at, at CARPEX. And also, thank you for linking our projects together. This is top, so now we have also already a matrix also for the panel discussion. Uh, we don't have time for audience questions now, but we will take them. I think we get back to that during the panel discussion. So the next session that we will be dealing with.